How much attenuation do you need to check for bad harmonics? Well, I'm gonna show you two ways today, the hard way and the shortcut. That's right, there's a shortcut to knowing how much attenuation you need for spectral purity testing. Let's take a look here at the bench while we write this all out and you subscribe to the channel. Uh, before actually we jump over into that, what I'm going to mention to you right now is I don't care. So I like to teach these things. I really do get a kick out of using all the cool equipment and stuff, but it becomes very difficult because all I ever hear is comments about how I'm a sad ham because I enjoy checking for spectral purity. If you would like to not care about spectral purity, I don't care. If you care about spectral purity, I don't care. If you want to learn, I'm happy and I'm here for you. Feel free to fast forward, but I am gonna read these FCC rules and regulations right here for my handy capable friends. And it says for a transmitter having a mean power of 25 watts or less, the mean power of any spurious emission supplied to the antenna transmission line must not exceed 25 microwatts and must be at least 40 dB below the mean power of the fundamental emission, but not to be reduced below the power of 10 microwatts. A transmitter built between April 15, 1977 or marketed before January 1st, 1978 is exempt from this requirement. What does this all mean? I'm gonna show you a calculation and a shortcut. I think it's important to mention that the reason we need to always charge our radios fully and we need to test the actual power output on each band before we get our attenuation is because as you can see here, our actual power output is part of that 25 microwatt requirement. And let me show you how this works with the whole technical thing right here. We pulled out an old TI-84 plus calculator. I think they call these calculators. Let's just do this equation here to determine if we had a five watt radio actually doing exactly five watts, how much attenuation we would want. So the first thing I did is I hit 10 log and I converted my microwatts or rather my wattage of the radio two microwatts. So five watts times a million is five million microwatts. Next, I divided that by 25 microwatts. Let's go ahead and close those parentheses up and see what we get for a number. In order to properly test for spectral purity, we need to have 53.01 dB of attenuation. But if there was only an easier way to do this without a scientific calculator, I got you. Knowing the equations is great, but I like shortcuts. And so if I go to m0ukd.com, I could find a conversion calculator that converts things like watts or microwatts into dBm, which you see here on the right. So five watts is 36.99 dBm. And then 25 microwatts is negative 16.02 dBm. But what if we took the inverse of negative 16.02? There it is, 53.01 dB of attenuation is needed for a five watt radio. And I'm gonna give you one more example right now. This is m0ukd.com. And let's go ahead and say that we're using a 10 watt radio that measures 10 actual watts like a, a TID radio, right? So now we have 40 dBm, dBm, and we're gonna add the inverse of 25 microwatts, 16.02. That means we need 56.02 dB of attenuation. And hey, I wanna point out though, maybe you see somebody using a 40 dB attenuator, but maybe they also have eternal attenuation. So they use 40 dB of external attenuation. Maybe they use something like 16 dB of internal attenuation, but they got to that number of 56.02 or roughly that amount of attenuation. Why is this so important? Imagine 25 years ago, you're working at an internet provider as a young college student, just trying to pay his bills through college. <laughs> but you have to work around this very expensive equipment a spectrum analyzer that at the time cost anywhere from 18 to 20 some odd thousand dollars. It's pretty nerve wracking. And if you didn't use the proper attenuation, a few things would possibly occur. That's the last thing you want when you're a college student trying to pay your way through college is to overload a spectrum analyzer and possibly damage it so it no longer functions correctly. Attenuation helps prevent that overloading from occurring. But also if we're talking about the reliability of results, while testing for spurs or bad harmonics, if you don't use the proper attenuation on top of potentially damaging your spectrum analyzer, you may get inaccurate results when it comes to the spectrum. For example, if I'm supposed to have 56 dB to get an accurate result and I'm only using 46 dB, my spurs might show much higher than they actually are and vice versa. I could pad, yeah, pad sounds like a good word. I could pad my radio with the attenuation so much so that it looks like everything is perfect and clean. But also, again, I just mentioned that you could have too much attenuation. So you really wanna be between 25 microwatts and 10 microwatts of attenuation, or 
negative 16.02 and negative 20 dBm of attenuation. So in conclusion, now you know how to calculate the proper attenuation to calculate for proper testing of the FCC rules and regulations, part 97 of the FCC. And there's a couple of requirements that I believe most professionals use when they're testing radios for spurs or harmonics. Number one, being a fully charged battery. And number two, making sure that the radio is on high power while these tests are conducted. Now, I never claim to be an expert, but as you can see, I have a little bit of experience doing this and I just enjoy it. I hope this video helped you out. And if it did, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, tell a friend. Thanks for watching the channel. Have a good one.